Okay, we're ready to start. Welcome to our travel panel. I am Linda Wheeler Donahue. I'm president of the Polio Outreach of Connecticut. And I like to travel. And I want to tell you a little bit about my experiences in flying so that maybe it could make that form of travel easier for you. My co-panelists are both very experienced travelers. The first is Joan Swain, PNNJ Vice President and editor of the wonderful Polio Network of New Jersey newsletter. And Joan will talk about cruising. Secondly, we have Lottie Esteban. Lottie has a wealth of practical advice on travel, whether it be land, sea, or also in the air. Our conference theme is Pathways to Wellness. And you know, travel is one of those pathways. We'd like you to hold your questions until all three of us finish, then we'll entertain questions. Traveling helps us enrich our lives, visit interesting new places, meet new people, see new plants and even animals. It's very broadening. So we're here to encourage you to leave your comfort zone and get out and travel. When I first got this assignment, I tackled it much like a research paper. And I guess it's the former college professor in me that I started getting all these books, studying them, and then I decided I would rather tell you my personal adaptations that have worked for me to help you as a polio survivor. So what are the steps that you need to take to assure a barrier-free trip? Well, since the passage of the Air Carrier Access Act in 1986 and then revised in 1990 and published, uh, air travel has been really revolutionized for people with disabilities in particular. There are many new rules and regs in place that will help you. To start, you choose your flight. Will it be a nonstop or a flight with legs of the trip? For me, I prefer a nonstop flight because for me, it's difficult to board and disembark and keep doing it repeatedly. So I will search and adjust the day of the week or whatever it takes to get a nonstop flight. Some people like a flight with different connecting flights to it because they want a break. They want to visit the restrooms in the terminal that are every 10 feet practically and they're very accessible and not so much on board the plane. If you do that, have connecting flights, I really strongly recommend one and a half hours between each leg. Otherwise, too frantic, chasing to get to your gate. So that is, that's my recommendation. Uh, call the airline. A lot of the success of your trip borders on planning ahead. Tell them you have special service requests. That's airline lingo. They, they abbreviate it SSR. And as soon as you say, hello, I have special service requests, they pay attention and they listen to what you're saying. You're going to tell them, I'll be traveling with a scooter. I'll be traveling with a cane. I'll be traveling with a manual chair or a power wheelchair. You say, I will need meet and assist service. What does that mean? Well, it means a wheelchair and a wheelchair pusher. And there is nothing as wonderful as that. I 
do a lot of speaking around the country and out of the country. And Sarah, my daughter, is usually with me. And even with Sarah with me, I get meet and assist because she has some mobility issues too. And she doesn't have to worry about trying to find all the ins and outs of the terminal. The meet and assist know it like the back of their hand. They're going to whisk you around in very efficient ways to get you either to the plane or to baggage claim at the end of your flight. It's a good idea to request an aisle seat. You don't want to be the third one in over here and be climbing over people to get out. And during the flight, even if you can't, well, let me start by saying if you can walk even a little bit, get up once an hour and move around. This prevents deep vein thrombosis. Very important to do. Well, in my case, I can't do that. So what do I do? A lot of wiggling around and moving parts of me like this and lifting one of my legs, whatever will move. And it keeps the blood moving, prevents deep vein thrombosis. And you do that once an hour. Now, I want to tell you about a disastrous flight. You may say, wait a minute, this is supposed to encourage us. But I think sometimes we learn by something that went wrong. Now, this is when I was less experienced in flying. I was going to the PHI conference, Polio Health International, in St. Louis. And this was in uh, 2005 at their, their con uh, convention there. Well, I was with a companion, and we're sitting, and you're always... If you have a disability, you're first on and last off. Don't be offended about being last off. It's better. The meet and assist has time to get to the gate and the door of the plane to take you, and you're not trampled around and pushed around by eager people trying to get their way off the plane. Well, we're first on, last off. My companion looks out the window and he says these, this fateful sentence, Linda, isn't that your wheelchair down there? Oh, yes, it was. It was on its side, joystick down, and in the pouring rain. It was on one of the baggage transporters, and this was when they weren't paying attention. So... I, I had a dreaded feeling like it's not going to work, it's not going to work, and of course it did not work. Uh, the dreaded flashing lights came on, and that was my first introduction to the CRO. CRO is the Complaints Resolution Officer. And since the Air Carrier Access Act, every airline, every terminal needs to have a CRO on duty 24 hours a day. People don't just fly during the nice daylight. They're flying all through the night, early morning, all hours of the day and night. The CRO must be available to you. Now, it's possible it will be by phone, but not usually. Usually in person, in his own little office. And you contact them and say, this went wrong. They transported my chair on its side and let pouring rain damage it. So I have to say, I was speaking at this convention. And any of you who use a mobility device pretty much all the time know. You'll know what I'm going to say. If you're not in your regular chair, scooter, walker, 
you're out, you're all, you're all thrown off, right? You're all out of sorts. You can't really be as free and comfortable at all as if you were in your own chair. And the, my power chair at that time had an elevating uh, seat that I used for, for um, teaching college classes because I wanted the, in the lecture halls students way far away to be able to see me. So I was looking forward to that, to use at PHI. Didn't happen. I was in a clunker of a manual chair on loan from the airline. Now, they did make it good. They repaired my power chair. They delivered it to the conference, albeit two days later. But it was about a four-day conference. So it worked out. But I learned a lot from that bad experience. Those don't happen to me anymore. The next time I flew was to Vancouver, and now I wasn't just the workshop person, I was the keynoter, so I needed to be on my game. I needed everything to be fine, and it was. I flew an airline, how many have heard of Cathay Pacific? Oh, there's world travelers in the room, and it's, it's a wonderful airline. Well, I brought a whole boatload of bubble wrap with me. And I explained to the agent, I need this joystick bubble wrapped up, guarded, protected. I had labeled every portion of the chair because they take it all apart. They give you your foot pedals. So you need to have a nice zippered bag with you to put those in. And they'll give you your seat of your chair. Anything that could come off. I love my saddlebags. Sarah calls me the bag lady, but I have to have them. Well, they come off. So you don't want them on your lap. The meet and assist guy is getting ready to push you away. So you just put them all in your zippered tote. When I showed the man my bubble wrap, he said, just a minute. And he took off. So I'm thinking, oh, I'll never see him again. No, he came back with a cone-shaped material of cardboard. He put the bubble wrap. He helped me tape it all up. He put this cone over that. And then he stuck it all with labels. Cafe Pacific, Destination, Vancouver. Everything was labeled. I even had arrows. This end up. Do not lay on its side, please. And that experience was flawless. Everything went perfectly with a few of those tips. I had photocopied instructions on how to take the batteries off and, and reassemble them into the chair if need be. They don't all do that. But if they wanted to do it, here's the instruction so they get it right. You know your chair and you have your, your manual or your scooter. So I wanted to just say, I can't take too much time because I want to have room for my fellow speakers. Um, although the ADA doesn't require it, a doctor's note describing your disability might alleviate some of the concerns at the security gate. You will have to go through security screening, as will your mobility device. They screen everything. A lady at uh, our dinner last night in our, in our group here was saying that they told her, stand up. Hold your arms a certain way for three minutes or something. If I don't care if it's 30 seconds. That's hard for polio survivors to do, especially as we're all aging. So her husband said she cannot do that. Now, the best thing is to be assertive. I cannot stand and walk next to my wheelchair or my scooter. I have to be in it. Screen me with the wand, and they know what to do, and they will do it. Um, 
another good adaptation, and then I'm going to get ready to turn it over to our cruising expert, is something you might have thought of, and that is cling wrap like, you know, the, uh, the plastic wrap that's frustrating in your kitchen when it sticks to itself. But it's a wonderful idea to take some time at home or bring it with you at the, and at the terminal, cover a lot of your chair or scooter with that. It'll protect it quite a bit, especially from dampness, which is an anathema to power equipment. In dents and dings and scratches, yes. So, forgive me because I had about 18 more things to say, but I, 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 I want to just say that I hope these adaptations will help you, that you'll get out, take to the skies, and have a barrier-free trip. And now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Joan Swain, who will talk on cruising. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my introduction to cruising came because I had a fear of flying after 9-11. And I had heard some tales about how you wore a brace and you had to take your pants slacks off and then your brace off and then, and it was pretty horrifying. So uh, when we had uh, the polio network, that is, invited Linda right here to come and lead us in a workshop uh, in May of 2007, I left that workshop feeling totally unafraid and uh, so I hope you have the same feeling as I did. Not only was I no longer afraid of flying, because she explained that the security system had eased up a little bit, and they were able to take a little, um, like, you know, cotton on the end of a stick, whatever you call those, Q-tips, dip it in something, and then wipe it around your, your shoe, so, and different parts of your wheelchair, scooter, that they'll just with that. So it, it wasn't the, the, the bad news situation that I had heard before. And she mentioned that um, <clears throat> she was going to be going on a cruise at the end of the year and thought that I might be interested in doing something like that. And this was a cruise that was uh, organized by uh, Maureen Sincula in at the uh, Boca Raton group down in, uh, in Boca Raton, Florida. And so I got in touch with uh, Maureen, and indeed uh, they put me on a wait list because they had all of the uh, all of the um, bumps were taken, and um, somebody canceled out, and I was able to go, and I had the most marvelous time, and have been cruising with that group ever since, and that's out of Fort Lauderdale, and I've had six I had my sixth cruise this January. And I've been to 16 countries on those on those cruises, and it's been a real education and a real pleasure. Because what's very interesting is that about half of the group, and there's anywhere from 30 to 40 people, um, depending on the economy, I guess, and um, half of them about come back. Uh, not the same half, but people about half of the group is always from previous, and uh, half are new. So. It's a bit of a reunion, as well as, as uh, you know, seeing old friends and meeting new ones. Um, the Royal Caribbean line and the Celebrity line is chosen by the Boca group because they are recognized as about the most barrier-free uh, and interested in making accessibility as high topic on their list. And they even have departments that uh, are devoted primarily just to that to accessibility. The other ones are another couple that also come up high, and that's the Princess Line and the Holland American. And that doesn't mean that the other lines aren't good. It just means that these are outstanding and come in voted as very accessible. Um, and the reason, you know, it's pretty 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 smart marketing because. 
most of the people who are taking cruises are older people. We're the ones with time, and if we're lucky, a little extra spending money to go on it. So um, it's in their best interest to make their boats, uh, their ships, excuse me, as, as comfortable and as easy to handle as possible. It's, I like the joy of cruising to me is that you uh, have a chance to see multiple exotic locations, eat any hour of the day of 24, <laughs> and unpack, unpack once. So it's easy. Um, first thing you need, of course, is a U.S. passport. Whether or not you'll have to show it every time uh, is, a, is a question, but that has to be gotten. And I always buy travel insurance just to be ready in case of a worst case scenario. And there's never been one as long as I've traveled. And I'm keeping it away by buying that, I'm convinced. Um, one hint that um, I would add to um, Linda's talk about flying is she mentioned the doctor's explanation of your condition. It's also a good idea if you carry with you a um, mobility, not a mobility device, but a mechanical medical device. Uh, I, for instance, will take along a um, toilet seat razor to use the night before in the motel or hotel that I'll be staying at because I like to travel down to Florida the night before just because it's apt to be snowy in the winter and you don't know what might come and it gets rid of all of that stress and strain of wondering whether I'll make it. But anyway, I always take that along in an L.L. Bean bag with a zipper on it, and that goes along with my uh, bag for my clothing and stuff. And they always question it and want to have me pay for it, since that second, you know, first bag is free, but none others. But they'll read that letter, I'll show it to them, and I've never had to pay since then. So that, that's a real insurance policy if you carry something. Uh, a surprise that I've learned uh, about Florida is that there are barrier-free cabs there just for the asking. You just go out of the uh, airport and out of the, um, the main building with your luggage that's being carried along by one of these nice people and just go to the cab taxi stand and ask for an accessible cab. And if one isn't right there, they'll call and they'll get one to you for about five minutes. It's glorious. Everywhere you go, they have them adapted. They're either uh, in minivans or usually it's something smaller that they just have take down a ramp and you just ride up and they tie you down and, and you're off. So there's nothing special. And we would be so lucky to have such a thing in New Jersey and New York and Connecticut. I don't know what it is like where you are, but I know here to get an accessible to go. And you're doing very heavy duty expenses. Um, so on to the ship. The handicap rooms are very spacious. And they are room to circle around, miss the furniture if you're not the least bit, probably even roomier than some rooms in your own home. And the bathrooms are extremely roomy. They have all have roll-in showers. You can get a bath chair there. I'm talking, again, Royal Caribbean and Celebrity, because that's the only experience I've had. So this is something you can always check out with the, the uh, cruising line that you're dealing with and ask very specific questions. Um, one thing that you should remember is that uh, we're talking two football fields in length from one end of the ship to the other. So that if you have any difficulty in walking, you want to uh, rent, rent, make arrangements with the, uh, the ship line to, uh, to rent a, um, a device. I think you know, electric, small electric scooter. A lot of people use the go-go scooters, which are not as big or as standard as, as mine, but it does a wonderful job. Uh, when, <clears throat> when we go down with the Boca group, they take an order of how many want to have have um, scooters and arrange for the rental and have them right in the room. So that works very nicely, and my voice is going. Um, as for dining, there's formal dining and there's casual dining. And on a, for example, a seven-day cruise, there'll usually be, well, there'll be two formal nights and then uh, five of, um, what do they call it, smart casual. So it's as if you're going out to a nice restaurant here. But you don't have to do that. Uh, you can also go and 
to the, um, the less formal, the, the buffet style, and have a wonderful assortment of food in a beautiful, beautiful location. And then there's uh, particular uh, res uh, restaurants with a, a particular theme throughout the ship, and little spots even around corners where, for example, it took me several days, but then I found they had just crepe. They would just serve mm -hmm. crepe. You know, so the nice little bits of things that you can do. There are many, many activities. Every night they have a, they hand out a four sheet, a uh, four sided sheet that will, uh, is on your bed when you come in from wherever you've been for dinner, such. And then um, this will tell you about what's going on the next day, how to change your watch to whatever time you're going back and forth. It gets a little crazy sometimes. Say, what time is it? You don't bed enough to know what day it is. So, and now another ex uh, important part of, of cruising is the excursions, and we always would go to um, uh, get some local um, person or group um, that Maureen would get during the winter time would set up to schedule the cruise. The ship, the <coughs> ship docks right at a location near on the edge of the old town, so all you do is go off the ship and ride around and. You're right in old Puerto Rico, in San Juan. Um, then we have accessible buses. They manage uh, St. Martin and St. Thomas, I guess, are pictured here. But we've had good luck. The, um, the, the cruises that the ships offer, I mean, of these excursions that the ships offer, often they might say that it's accessible, barrier-free, but um, they don't, aren't always quite that way. And there, it turns out that you can't really maybe get off the bus as often as you'd like. <clears throat> They're also about three or four times more expensive. So the, the recommendation is if you're going to be in port and you want an excursion, you should try it, booking one yourself or, or thinking about that. Um, you can also, if you don't want to go on an excursion, there are always shops nearby. And... Um, they know, they know who's going to be spending money, and so they have little tourist areas. So that even if you don't go on a wider uh, trip, you have something to see in the country. And then there's so much to do just to stay on ship that many people prefer just to swim. I mean, there are pools that they can swim in, or the casinos are not open when you're in port. They're only open when you're on the high seas. But there's plenty, plenty else to do. So, and the good news is that the... Um, most, most of the, uh, there's very little, put positively, there's very little tendering that I've run into these days. These countries are building concrete roads out to, as I call them road, out to the deep end where the ships can now pull up and, and it becomes an extended pier. So you have, that's a long walk sometimes too to get into the shore, but that's been wonderful. They've done that recently in Belize and in Labadee. So that's a thing of the future. In closing, I uh, just wanted to mention that last year there were 12 million people who um, chose cruising, and um, I'd suggest that you, if you have any interest, don't let the last year's miserable winter and the scare technique, just remember that was one cruise line. Yes. It had a lot of problems, but it was only one, and I won't mention its name. <laughs> you know what it is. And uh, you can do your... Uh, you do your own um, research online, um, anything you want to look for. Just put it, Google it, as we say, and uh, you'll be able to find it. So shake your fears and do your research and consider that one, one unpacking and one packing and have a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, all, and welcome. Um, well, you've gotten, you've cruised, or you have flown to wherever it is you're, you're going, and um, you want to see the things that you went to that particular place to see. So um, I've highlighted three different um, places, uh, Disney World, uh, Disney World, Disneyland, uh, Las Vegas, and um, I picked Maui because it's just an absolutely gorgeous place. Um, the, uh, there, there's, there are websites for um, uh, people with disabilities. Disney has a wonderful, wonderful website, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, 
about their own uh, barrier-free transportation. Uh, their rooms are wonderful. Uh, the hotels are all very accessible. And they have, they, if you're staying at Disney, they have a wonderful system. Their, their monorail, their boats, and their buses are all barrier-free. So it's not a problem getting from Magic Kingdom to Epcot or Epcot to um, whatever. I think they call it Hollywood Studios now. It used to be MGM. Um, Universal. No? It, I don't. I think Universal is some is something else. But um, but they have a wonderful. So if if the your children say, oh, you know, we're taking the grandkids to Disney. Uh, you know, we'd love you to come along. Don't be afraid. Um, it's everything is accessible. The restaurants will uh, make accommodations for you. Uh, very, uh, they're all very, uh, very nice. Disney is always extremely nice. And um, what I really want to talk about, wherever you go, is van rentals. Renting an accessible van, which is um, the first thing that I do once I just decided where I want to go and approximately when I want to go there, the very first thing is I'll call the van rental franchise and um, see, do you have a van for this particular time? Uh, and I put in, I included some of the places that I have rented from and have had good experiences with. The one thing, um, there's, uh, I, I put a sample application also, but the, the one thing to remember is that renting, these, these are local, like almost mom and pop franchises. They're not like renting from Hertz where you can rent it in Orlando and leave it in Miami. Uh, they're two, those happen to be two separate franchises. So uh, they, they don't love you to leave it in one and another. The one, the franchise in um, Las Vegas is in Arizona. The uh, wheelchair getaways franchise is Arizona and Nevada. So you can rent it in Phoenix and leave it for a fee in um, Las Vegas. Uh, and the, their fees, airport pickup fees can vary if you, uh, you know, if it's important to you or they'll meet you at the hotel. Uh, you have to discuss all of these things with the uh, the agent that you speak, the rental agent that you that you speak with. Uh, sometimes they'll just leave the keys in the. I put wheel well, but I think it's the the where the the gas cap opens. They'll leave the keys in there and tell you where it is at the airport parking lot. And if you know that's your choice, but I like when they meet me at the baggage claim because then they can help me with my luggage. So it's you know it, yeah um, you know depending on on what you want to pay. Um, I'm going to talk a little about the auto train. We just uh, had, had our first, uh, my son came, went with me on the auto train and we had um, kind of different experiences with it. Uh, it will get you safely, you and your car, from one end to the other. Um, doing it was uh, quite, they have, they call it an ADA room. It is not the most comfortable in the world. It has a lock. It's private. It has a lock. But the, um, and it's big enough. It's big enough for a wheelchair and a companion. But the toilet and sink are right, literally, kind of like, I, I thought it was kind of like a jail cell. <laughs> I don't know from firsthand experience. <laughs> but from what I've seen on Law & Order, it was kind of like, uh, it's, they don't have Wi-Fi. So you would bring reading material and whatever is downloaded. Um, it's one night. Um, my son would do, my son Alex over there. He would do it again. I'm not so sure I would, but I would send him down with with my car if you know he would be anxious to do it again. Uh, they will bring your meals to you. You cannot go from the dining from there. You're there once you are in there. You're in there you, because it's very difficult. If you can walk, I guess, with a walker or a cane, maybe you could get from there to the dining car. I would think with, if you have a balance issue or, you know, a, a stability issue, it would be very, very difficult. They will bring your meals. They were very, very helpful. I have to, my room attendant was just wonderful. So train travel, um, it, it, in general, I don't think is the most ideal for anyone using a wheelchair with a mobility issue. But... Um, now, my accessible cab service uh, experience has been very different from Joan's. 
uh, I've gotten to the airport, and it's yeah, it's a half an hour away. It's you know, it's Las Vegas is absolutely the best I found for accessible cab service. They, you tell them this is what you need, the hotel people or the, you know, will get it for you, and they're there very very quickly. But Florida, I've not had California, uh, no. On, and also on the cruise, uh, the cruises. When you get to the cruises. Um, what I've done in the past, and it's a rather pricey option, is prior to, in advance of the cruise, hired my own driver. If there's something that I really, really want to see, that's a, not a cheap option. It's, it's a little on the pricey side, but it, it will, they will take you to places that are... Uh, we had one wonderful experience. We hired the driver, and he took us to a place that uh, I don't know why it was not on the cruise line's um, list of, of uh, things to see, but it was in um, Chile, and it was a replica of a, a Magellan ship. Very, very interesting. But it was, for some reason, not on the cruise lines. Maybe they didn't have a pro profit sharing thing. I don't know. But the drivers did take us, and... Um, so you get to see a little bit different things and get a whole other take than you would from a regular sightseeing. But they are licensed, and I do emphasize to go through the cruise line. If you're going to hire a private driver, let the cruise line do it for you, because otherwise they won't hold the ship or, you know, do any of those things if you're not, if you're not using their person. Um, casino destinations, and I don't know if you've had the same experience, very accessible. Um, Las Vegas, Atlantic City, um, Atlantis not so much, but um, Las Vegas and Atlantic City, very, very accessible. Um, they, I've seen the guy, the uh, casino uh, people, unbolt a chair so somebody could wheel right up to the dollar slot machine and play. Um, very accessible. They usually, if they can get a little crowded, it can get a little wiggly in there, but... Um, for the most part, they're very accessible. The restaurants are usually great. Uh, shows, when you make the arrangement for the shows, you... Um, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> you tell the box office, I need accessible seating, and they are usually amazingly good seats. Um, they're close to the front, and they're, you can generally see pretty well. Um, if you do go to Las Vegas, they have, you don't have to take your life in your hands to get across Las Vegas Boulevard. They have um, overpasses with elevators um, that generally are working. I, I, don't, I, I don't think I've experienced one that was not working. The monorail, their monorail is wonderful, and the Eiffel Tower, the Paris Eiffel Tower, uh, you can get up there, and that's also a very, very nice uh, attraction there. Um, if you can think you can handle the plane ride to Hawaii, uh, we loved Maui. Just an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous uh, destination. Um, they only had manual, the, um, the, uh, uh, ran the uh, van franchises only had manual, ones with manual ramps, or so we were told, and I had my, my uh, official ramp um, assistant <laughs> over there. <laughs> I don't know how, I wouldn't have been able to do it without him, but, um, th but the, now I, I, from doing this web research, I since found out there is one remote controlled ramp in Maui, and I will get it next time I go. Um, you do have to have a heart for the plane ride because it is very long. It could be three stops, um, because generally it would be here, San Francisco, San Francisco to a while. Or actually, you can go direct to Maui from San Francisco and from Phoenix. And from Phoenix, we found out. So uh, if you have the heart for that long ride, I think it's uh, Hawaii is an absolutely fabulous destination. And the other one I'd like to talk about is, uh, very briefly, is Alaska. When I went to Alaska in 2007, there was one ramp van in the whole state for rent one. And now I just, again, through my, my, and I included a bunch of websites in the, the back of this, um, I discovered there is now a Wheeler's franchise that I'm sure has more than one uh, ramp uh, vehicle for rent, and hopefully they're remote controlled as well. So um, I, I hope you will um, 
you know, really uh, try traveling. It's just an amazing way to discover new cultures, new people, new sites. Um, just it just opens your lifts your spirits and just opens you up to a whole new. Uh, and you realize what a wonderful place this world really is, in spite of all the horrors that have gone on recently. It's the world really is a beautiful place, and I uh, wish you happy travels, everyone. Now we're going to take a minute for questions and answers, and we wanted to ask if you could try to say it's for Linda for flying, or Joan for cruising, or Lottie for land travel. If you forget our names, you could just say a cruising question or whatever. So if you, rather than give everybody all the questions. You're within your rights to say, I need my cane. They will put it in the overhead bin and you, when, not when the wheel, um, seatbelt light is on, but once you're up and, and cruising altitude, you tell this, the uh, flight attendant, I need to go to the restroom, I need my cane. And they have to give that to you. A folding cane is a good idea. Well, the cane goes up above. Oh, then you need the aisle chair, and, and it's, you don't propel it yourself. They must push it to the lavatory. That's why I think best thing, use the terminal bathrooms first. Do a nonstop flight, get right off, use the lavatory again in the terminal. You have all the room in the world. And don't break. Yes, withhold food and water. They really say that in some of the books I brought. Withhold food and water for a while. It just makes life a little bit easier. Oh, that's a service, um, yes. I haven't used them personally. We have one person coming up. I wondered if there's anyone behind me trying to get my attention. All right, your yeah. turn. Yes. Yeah, what uh, you mentioned, uh, and this gentleman was mentioning the job. Uh, if mentioning you what? to be on a six-hour flight and you're not a camel, uh, <laughs> you're going to have to use that job. Yeah. How do you do it if you're an insurance? Before you ever flew at all, you've notified the airline, you have a disability, you need SSR, special service request. This kind of flags your, your account. Then, if you cannot walk at all, they come when you ask to go to the lavatory with the aisle chair. They bring you to the lavatory. They cannot assist you inside the lavatory, but they but can get... An yes, they, and then that person's allowed in. Um, if it's... In well, <laughs> my daughter's been in there with me. Yeah, yeah. What, what um, they also now have larger accessible bathrooms. Yeah, plane. if it's a plane... With, if the plane has two aisles and it's a newer plane, it'll have one accessible bathroom. It's a wonderful new. Um, yes, yes, yeah, it's great. And you know, we don't know how accessible. No, but knowing, yeah, but knowing that, you can ask for uh, when you're planning your flight. Well, what newer planes do you have with two or more aisles? So you get some of those features. What were you asking? Um, on the cruises, uh, do they have uh, accessible pools? And what do they look like? Do they have um, candles for you to use? Oh, lifts. They have lifts. Let's say someone can take a few steps and go in walking a little bit. Um, do they have stairs that have two handles? No, but they have a lift. So if you oh. can't do one handle, Oh, 
Now, this gentleman had a question? Yes. Oh, you're talking about the jetway that goes up to the... Pl oh, oh, okay, right, escalator. Yes, SSR and meet and assist. Those are your two key phrases. The meet and assist will avoid the escalator. They know where the elevators are. You'll never find them. They're in the bowels of the building, but they know where they are. And you can avoid the escalator. A lot of us can't do escalators. We've been told our time is up. Want to thank you for coming. Thank you. And we'll do it again.